Hey YouTube, how's it going? It's Rob Avis here and I'm here with John Steinman. How's it going, John? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, for those of you guys who don't know who John is, John's actually a pretty famous dude. He's, he ran uh, Deconstructing Dinner for a long time. I was on CBC, wasn't it? Never made it onto CBC. It was on Community Campus Radio Station. That's where it was, All yeah. across the country. Yeah, totally. And so, let's go back to Deconstructing Dinner, because it's kind of, or we can go back further if you want. Mm -hmm. Like, where, where does this all start for you? Because today we're going to be talking about John's book that he just wrote, The Grocery Story. And I think there's some really interesting ideas inside of this book that uh, we're going to get out of John today, talking about, talking about what he just wrote about and how it applies to a sustainable and just food system in the future. Mm. So let's, let's go back to the early days. Yeah, well, it, you know, the book really does begin with deconstructing dinner. So, you know, I spent five years researching the food system, looking at everything from big food all the way down to little food and all the great initiatives like the work you've been doing. And, and at the end of the day, when I left that radio show and produced a television series and got some more like content through that, I was kind of left wondering, OK, well, what's next? What's what's missing in this bigger conversation because the conversation around the future of food and good food is continuing to grow as far as I see it um, and I really asked myself what's missing in the conversation I wanted to fill something that was missing and I found that grocery stores being the place where still at the end of the day most of us are buying food was a piece that was really missing from the big conversation and so there's 92% of all the food that we purchase for the home continues to be purchased at grocery stores so you know, here we have this surge in farmers markets, CSA is growing our own food, and it's certainly making a difference. But as far as like that dent that I hope our food can make on the larger food system, it feels like the grocery store is the place to really devote attention to. And so I did a, I did a search, I looked like, okay, well, who's written about this? Who's written about like the impact of the grocery store on the entirety of the food system? And sure enough, there hasn't been one book published here in North America that specifically looks at like, Here's how grocery stores came to be, the big ones particularly. Here's how they influence the food system. Um, and I talk about grocery stores as like a bottleneck within the food system where we have all this, all these people producing food at the top in this big bubble, like half a billion people on the planet. And then we have like all of us seven plus billion eaters. And then most of that food's having to go through this tiny bottleneck of a handful of grocery stores. Right. And so this is so, sort of where I was left. It was like, okay, someone's got to write a book about not only how the grocery store is influencing the food system, but what we can do about it. Other than not just going to farmers markets and CSAs and growing our own food. Yes, let's keep going in that direction. But how do we also start to influence the grocery store and add that into this kind of good food ecosystem? Cool. So just to give you guys a bit of context, John lives in Nelson. He lives in a, an intentional community. Would you call it that? Like a cooperative? It, well, it's a co-housing community. Co yep. community. So yeah. it's an intentional community using the co-housing model. Okay. Yep. And if you've ever been to Nelson, BC, they've got Fuji Co-op there, which is an incredible grocery store. They've actually got their own co-housing thing there going on, right? Well, we built some housing on top of the store, okay. but it's not co-housing. Right? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So John comes from a community where the central watering hole, so to speak, is is super progressive, and uh, we're going to get into a little bit about that later in the, in the interview. But just listening to you talk about the importance of grocery stores, I live in a multi generational family, so we live with my mother in law, mm -hmm. and she grew up in rural Saskatchewan and baby boomer, and so she can still remember the first day that the grocery store came into town. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting over the last year, couple of years, or 10 years, I should say, living with her and doing permaculture and kind of influencing the food in our house and where we get our food and, and, and all of the cultures around that and to kind of hear her relive her childhood and to recognize that for that generation, when they moved from everything came from the farm or from the neighbor or from the community to it coming from the grocery store, it was almost a seamless transition and the trust that they had within their community to, to, to supply healthy food to them mm -hmm. was almost subversively transferred into the grocery store. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and so it's taken a long time to train my mother-in-law and we love her to death and we wouldn't be able to do what we've done with, without all of her support, but mm -hmm. to almost detrust some of the, well, basically the grocery store. It's like you cannot trust that they're going to actually be looking out for your best interests. Mm -hmm. And I heard you talking at your talk today about 
Right. So just a little bit more background. I come from the industrial food system. So we had a 40,000 square foot cake factory. And we sold the Safeway to Costco and to Walmart. Right. And, and so I know all about the fees that you pay to get your products listed. Yeah. And the people that pay the most are the ones that get their products listed in the best places in the store. And, and there's just no way that the local farmer could ever pay for that kind of listing fee. Exactly. So it's totally crazy. Well, yeah, and so, you know, there's this, you, you were talking about like the trust within the grocery store. And so I write about this in my book, how when we, when we really unpack like the role of the grocery store in our community and how much impact it's having, not only in our community and for the people producing food around it, but just the larger food system, you know, grocery stores aren't just a business selling food. They really are in our communities providing an essential service and one that I think carries an extreme level of responsibility. Right. You know, one that would lead to us either trusting or not trusting them, but they, they bear this responsibility that in our culture we don't place onto grocery stores. We don't say this grocery store, there might only be one of them in our town, maybe two in our neighborhood. We don't say, you know, you're responsible for this community's well-being. We don't, we don't do that because over the past 100 years, we've left this essential service of providing food in the hands of the private sector. And it's this funny thing because in our culture, particularly in Canada, where we really do pride ourselves on leaving things that are of essential service in the hands of the public. We've said, you know, libraries, public transit, roads, schools, these things are important enough that we want them to be in this category over here, managed by public institutions, regulated by the public, and yet food we've left in the private sector. And so this co-op model, the model of a consumer-owned grocery store, it brings that idea of our food and our grocery stores providing an essential service to us and it says you know what we're going to build that accountability and responsibility into the model by making sure that the people who are running the store Bob, how are you hey <laughs> sorry <laughs> about interrupting i just wanted to say oh uh, good yeah uh, that's what happens when you come to mother of news fairs <clears throat> Anyways, so you were saying before we got interrupted. Well, I think that my last thought there was um, with the cooperative model by by allowing people who shop at the store to be an owner in the store, yeah. for that store to be owned by the people in the community, it means that that responsibility that I think we should expect of our grocery stores is built into the model. Totally. Yeah. They got skin in the game. They got skin in the game and, and the stores are run by people in the community. I mean, that alone is enough to really ensure that the grocery store is like operating in the interest of the community and it's opening up their space to the people who are producing food in the area, not charging them. You know, you talk about what are known as slotting fees, which I write about in my book, and it's this incredible thing that's been happening in the food system that most consumers, eaters, are unaware of, is that the grocery store shelves are actually being sold, particularly in those center aisles, being sold to the highest bidder. Cool. You know, this idea that we are voting with our dollar when we walk into the grocery store, it's becoming a bit more of a myth because voting with our dollar is great when we have choice, right. but the choice right now is being more determined by, by the food manufacturers and the grocers. It's not so much us choosing. No, of course not. Yeah. Tell me about this this project then. You, you basically realized that we're not holding our grocery stores accountable. Nobody's really telling the story. Mm -hmm. so you've got a great example of one in Nelson, BC. Mm -hmm. So, what? I mean, what else inspired you to write the grocery story? Well, yeah. So, it, it was a piece missing, I think, from the bigger food conversation. And then the other thing that motivated me to write it was like, yeah, like you say, me having experience with a community-owned grocery store, one that's in our case in Nelson, BC, been around for 45 years almost now. And we, as a grocery store, I think, have had this incredible impact on our community. Like we've in a way become like the hub in the community for good food so this is the place where you're going to find like workshops on how to make kombucha sauerkraut composting workshops like it's happening in the store as part of our sort of educational offerings and so it really is like the kind of hub that i think a lot of people who talk about a, a, a hub in a community for good food we're doing that through our grocery store and so our co-op is owned by 13,000 people in our community uh, about two-thirds of that number are people who are actively using the store so we as shoppers as eaters we've gone in and become shareholders by purchasing a share for in my case fifty dollars and that allows me to be a co-owner in my store I get to vote for my board of directors every year so I first thought okay I want to 
write a story about this really innovative way of running a grocery store. And then I figured, okay, well, I'm going to write a story about the co-op. And then I started looking deeper into the U.S. where there's this movement of similar co-ops that are happening here where we are right now. And found, you know, there's 230 co-ops just like ours operating across the country with over 300 locations. And so my focus actually went further into the U.S. And from there, I decided to look at the history of grocery retailing. So that not only could I talk about food co-ops, but I could talk about like how the big grocers have evolved in the U.S., in Canada, and how co-ops have actually emerged in waves. There was like a wave in the 1930s. There was a wave in the 1970s, and now there's this new wave of co-ops that I think have been emerging out of the sort of good food, local food movement of the 21st century. And there's at least 100 of them in the works here right now in the U.S. And so I actually spend more of my time talking about what's happening here in the U.S., but I talk about our co-op as well in Nelson, B.C., how it came to be, how it's impacting and working with food makers in our area. And so that was really the motivation was like, Let's look at how these big grocers came to be, because this is a hundred years in the making. It's sort of built into the DNA of the food system. You know, the price that we expect to pay for food has been dictated by grocery stores for the past 100 years. Um, and then co-ops have shown up at these interesting points where people have felt pushed to the edge. And that's often when co-ops emerge, whether it's a food co-op or a farmer co-op, you name it, co-ops emerge at these moments in history where we start to really see the impact of what we've been taking for granted. And this is, you know, really the story I tell is like, we're in one of those times, whether we see it or not, I think, you know, there's a lot of bubbles that we're all living in, but we're in one of those moments now. And I think this is the future of food is having community owned grocery stores that can then help incubate all these other alternative models that are also are really important, like the farmer's market, the permaculture approach like you're doing, the CSAs, the direct marketing, growing our own food, you know, co-ops can help support all of that happening through the grocery store model. So what was your biggest insight writing this book? You know, what I took, what, what, what I learned that I didn't know was particularly here in the U.S. where we are right now, there is this incredible history of resistance and restraint of the chain grocers. And I had no idea. In fact, most people I talk to, as I've been, on, I've been on a book tour here for now, um, what is it, a month and a half. And so I talk to people about this because it's the first few chapters of my book, and very few people are aware. In fact, one of the journalists I quote in here calls this era, which began really in the 1910s and went all the way through the late 1970s. He calls it a forgotten history of America. Mm. So it's this uh, period where there was no such thing as a chain retailer like we see today. And so when they first came into the scene, people were up in arms. They were right. like, wait a minute, you know, we've got like entire towns filled with independent businesses. We we have built a culture around these independent businesses and then here come these chains with their size. A and P was the first one. Kroger came in next here in the US. They used their size to start undercutting the competition. And everybody could see it in a way that today we don't see it. It's a bit we're a bit blind to it. And so all these levels of restraint came in and helped prevent them from growing to the scale that um, eventually they were able to grow because a lot of those protections eventually eroded. What's super interesting about that, coming mm -hmm. from the cake industry, is mm -hmm. how the very cannibalism that occurred in, so these big guys cannibalized these small guys, mm -hmm. it's still happening. I mean, Walmart and Amazon, like, it's just the model just continues to evolve. Um, and so the cannibalism just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yep. And uh, we witnessed that in the cake industry. And, and um, the, the, the end point is essentially the destruction of, of that centralized system. Eventually, just, it just can't exist. Or, or maybe that's not the end point. What, what I think um, I've noticed as a, as a result of being in these big, huge conglomerates, and then now kind of being on a more of a decentralized food pathway myself, is that the, the big guys can't occupy all the niches. It's not possible. They can't move as quickly as the farmers, as quickly as cooperatives. So essentially, they become bound by scale. Mm -hmm. And their scale is such that they cannot adopt the, the trends. Um, not that we should all be eating based on trends. We should be eating good quality food. That's the only trend that really matters. Mm -hmm. But um, there's just no way that they can uh, operate with the same level of ethos that, that a, uh, an owner cooperative um, can, 
can do. I mean, because that grocery store is going to represent the wants and needs of those people in that community versus the Kroger or the NP is going to respond to the wants and needs of the corporate mm -hmm. directorship, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. Um, so so now you're on book tour. You're going right across the states. What's your what are your next stops coming up? Yeah, so I've been on a book tour now for a month and a half. I have gone to about 35 co-ops. Okay. I got another 20 to go until the end of the spring, early summer. And then uh, I travel back to British Columbia and I'm going to do it all again in the fall. But right now, you know, here in Frederick, Maryland, I'm off to Harrisonburg tomorrow, Virginia. And then down to North Carolina where I'll be for at least two weeks. I'm going to be at an annual conference of okay. food co-ops. So I've got cool. like co-ops from all over the country that are going to be gathering at this place. And do you have a website? Yeah, and my website with my book tour is grocerystory.coop, C-O-O-P. Right, Coop. Yeah. like co-op. Like co-op, yeah, so co-ops have their own little like uh, tag on their domain. And uh, yeah, so mine's grocerystory.coop. Okay, cool. Yeah. Is there any other insights you want to share with the, the audience? Well, you know, I've had a, I've had an interesting experience because I didn't get a chance to go and sit in grocery stores to, re to help research for this book, but I have been because over the past month and a half, I've been sitting in grocery stores with my book at a table, and I've been able to watch the culture of grocery shopping. Unlike most people probably get a chance, like I'll literally be in a store for hours where I just get to watch that relationship people have to the grocery store. And I had no, I mean, I had an idea, but I had never really seen this the way I've seen it, how, how passive grocery shopping can be. Mm -hmm. You know how routine and habitual and and you know I don't want to say fully thoughtless because I know people are coming in and considering that they're walking into a co-op like I know that considerations there but even in co-ops there's this just take it for granted I'm walking into a grocery store and I just hope that at least from what I've been seeing I hope we can start to move in a direction where it's like before we walk into those grocery stores we kind of take a moment and realize how important that experience is about to be and what and how important that building we're walking into is because uh, because it is and so this has been a big takeaway for me from this trip is uh, is that relationship and I'm hoping that can change and, uh, and that's been the intention with the book and the book tour. So just to kind of close this video out, one of the biggest insights that I had listening to John speak today and thinking about cooperatives, I've been thinking quite a bit about cooperatives lately because John mentioned it earlier that should grocery stores and even our food supply system be allowed to be privatized? And I mean, I know that's kind of a bit of a blasphemy in a, in a capitalist-based society, but uh, you know, what differentiates a road or a power grid or any of these, or medical care for Canadians from our grocery store when we're eating uh, three meals a day? And the problem with that argument is that it's a slippery slope because all of a sudden you start going through your head and it's like, well, what about, like, if, if grocery stores are going to have that relationship, shouldn't farms and, and land and, like, where the food actually comes from? And, and so all of a sudden it starts opening up all these categories and you start thinking, like, well, maybe there should be more of these cooperative-type organizations to manage some of these services that we classify as, as essential. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that this this domain that you're you're writing about, which is co-ops in general, which is almost towards the end of the chain, but needs to go all the way back. And it is probably one of the best examples of um, impact that urbanites can have uh, to control their food system is actually to control how their food is acquired. And because once, once you have control over, as, as an organization or as a group of people um, over that, then you can start to um, put those dollars towards regenerative farming practices and ecological yep. stewardship and all of the stuff that so there's a really nice tie-in into that and so mm -hmm. I really um, I really had a lot of insights listening to you today so mm, if you are in the States or in Canada I'm gonna put uh, John's website below John runs an annual film festival yep deconstructing dinner film festival in Nelson okay yep. so I'll put that link in the show notes below and I really encourage you guys to get out and uh, participate in one of John's talks. You pick up his copy at, at his talks, uh, and I'll also put the New Society publisher's 
link in the show notes as well so you can get it. It's always best to buy it from the publisher or direct from the author if, if you're there. And it's amazing to have guys like you thinking about this stuff. It's mm. just so wonderful to be rowing alongside uh, incredible thinkers just like yourself. Well, and it's an honor to share a publisher with you. Awesome, John. <laughs> Thank you.